symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Uh, excuse me? Who are you, sir? Uh, who, oh, that's that's the promoter who skipped out on us. Uh, how many shows did you miss? Seven, eight, nine, so, something like that. Mr. Thompson, Jeff Jarrett over here. Uh, I've been here in this seat every week. It is my world, Jeff Jarrett. I am glad you decided to join us today. I'm, you big rat. I'm kidding, Conrad. Good to one see episode. You. I, miss I know. We had a lot of fun, the My World listeners. Fantastic feedback. Shout out to Polly B. Had a lot of fun on those Q&As. Uh, often, uh, when he would ask the question, Conrad, I thought, man, if Conrad was asking this, I know what he would be. He'd be digging on it. But so good to see you, my man. Hey man, I'm excited to be here with you. I can't believe this is all happening this week. We've got so many fun things to talk about right at the top of the show. I want to address that as you and I are recording yesterday was the 20 year anniversary of your baby, all grown up <laughs> TNA now impact wrestling just did their slam anniversary show this past Sunday. Dixie Carter came back. We had a video from AJ styles and a lot of folks were really surprised that you know, some of these old names popped up and it was in your town. It, was this a little surreal for you to think that all these years later, it's still alive and kicking. And I mean, this was your idea coming to life and now it's 20 years old. It, la it outlasted ECW and that lasted WCW. Heck, I think it outlasted both of them combined <laughs> and, and, and nobody had that on their bingo card. Starting in 02, the very year TNA launched. People started predicting, oh, it'll only last to here. Oh, if they make it to that point, oh, it's doom and gloom. 20 years later, still here. What must that feel like to be Jeff Jarrett yesterday and know, man, 20 years. You know, Conrad, that's a, I mean, when you put it, I, I wasn't expecting that right out of the gate. Like, what did it feel like? Uh, I'll tell you what I did yesterday. And maybe it's really appropriate that uh, yesterday was father's day. And I got to spend the, the entire evening with my father. Wow. So, uh, we chatted about all kinds of things and, you know, it's no secret, the ups and the downs and all that, but 20 years later, and man, the amount of text Conrad that I got starting about Thursday of last week about it coming up and, you know, uh, it's not the asylum, but it is, it was at the fairgrounds, same area. Um, so, you know, for those guys to have it there and 20 year anniversary, and it's, um, it's surreal when you put it in the context of ECW and WCW and, and, and all that. And what's, you know, you can take the negative and viewpoint of this or the positive, but obviously from the Jarrett's and then at a Carter Carter's in and then we could have, you know, that, that other investor that stepped up to the plate, uh, we can talk about potentially of Toby Keith and then Billy Corgan and, uh, Anthem, you just kind of look at the history of it, but at the end of the day, uh, that Twitter account, if you will, that was started and that YouTube account, uh, and that tape library, uh, that we've for our first international tape that was shipped to India. You know, you just kind of put it all together and think, wow, 20 years and it's still rocking and rolling and uh, don't see that brand slowing down. And we're obviously in the age of streaming. So look, congrats to everyone that's a part of that, uh, part of that fan base, part of the product and uh, hats off to everyone uh, that showed up. Um, uh, hats off to all the talent through the years and uh Conrad, just a simple request for me to give a little throwback to put this whole in context. What's your favorite line of those first few episodes that Dusty eloquently articulated that just kind of a throwback, a midget, a beaten off <laughs> in a trash can. <laughs> no. Shout out to Crowbar who sends that to me every week. And I realized that, that is not a word we're supposed to say in 2022, but the idea that Dusty Rhodes stood to ring and says, it says wrestling on the marquee. It does not say a little person, a beaten off in the trash can. 
Oh, but no, all kidding aside, pretty cool. Oh 20 God. years, we're going to actually be talking about Dusty some today. I'm excited about this episode because it has got TNA in its very DNA. But uh, no, it was really cool. Happy, uh, you know, the, the people behind the scenes, look, all the talent through the years. I mean, we could go through. It was great that AJ Styles was a part of it. He was so integral from really 2002, from day one. He was the first, a part of the first match. Uh, and his last set of tapings, which we've covered in 2013, really special. But, you know, every superstar that we could talk about through the years, obviously hats off. But all the production folks, Keith Mitchell, I've had a conversation with him recently. And we uh, chuckled and laughed and they got serious. But, you know, from Keith Mitchell, all the production folks, just the office folks, Andy Barton, shout out to AB. I know he's a listener. Um so just all the folks that, that really put a lot of time, effort, love, and everything else that goes with it. So, uh, yeah, 20 years. Very, very cool. Very cool indeed. Uh, we should also mention, uh, as people are listening to this, yesterday morning it was announced that we're moving Ric Flair's last match to Municipal Auditorium, and uh, we're no longer in the Nashville Flair Grounds. Uh, tickets go on sale this Friday. So if you missed your opportunity to pick up a ticket to see Ric Flair's last match, more tickets will be revealed this Friday. Sign up for the email list so you know exactly how to get a hold of the pre-order and all that jazz at rickflairslastmatch.com. And uh, Jeff, the rumor and in innuendo is that some of that undercard starts getting announced this week. And I know that, uh, well, you know people, so you've had a peek at some of that undercard. I think fans who were on the fence about, I don't know, do I really want to see Ric Flair wrestle one last time? Now, a whole lot of fans are not thinking that way, but boy, this undercard, I feel like it's going to make this show pretty damn can't miss. What say you, Jeff? Conrad, I am so stoked. And look, uh, you know, Paulie B was sitting in the seat last week and that text exchange, I think we covered it last week. You were like, uh, Hey guys, I messed up. Uh, I, I won't be able to record. I am doing this and that. And I obviously went right into, oh, you're a promoter now and you just want to blow things off. Okay. But no, uh, hats off, dude. You have worked your cojones off. And I really think, I don't even like to call things undercards, but yes, that's what it is. But the attractions, Yes. Yeah, that probably doesn't sit well, but I like whatever. I don't want to call them match. The full no, match really card. Don't. Yes. The full I, show. The, entire, the, the attractions, the uniqueness, the specialty. I'll say all the brands. I'm not giving too much away that are going to be a part of this. Uh, Conrad, they give too much away there. No. Uh, okay. So just the, look, guys, I'm hyped. I am, um, what is this, 36 years for me in and, and counting? But if we want to count my little tight days and, sitting in uh, my dad's office, watching, um, videos, it, 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 it's, it, this is one of those cards that, you know, and it goes without saying Rick on top and last match and everything that goes with that is very, very special. But when you put the cherry on top is that it's in my hometown, but when you put this kind of mega event together in 2022, it's amazing. I, I, I don't know how to put it in words because look, uh, triple a, they bring talent in from, from a different, you know, the forbidden door show coming up and new Japan, AW, all of that is really, really cool. But Conrad, what you worked hard, put together all the brands that are going to be representing this. A lot of them, by the way, a lot that's what them. I'm saying. It's, 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 uh, folks, I'm not overhyping this. You just wait. You just wait, stay tuned to Starcast at Starcast events, right? That's exactly right. And this Thursday, uh, I think you're going to be joining us. You know, a person or two in Nashville, we're going to have a lot of fun at the press conference. Do we want to give a peek, a, a tease of what we might be talking about there? Oh, well, you know, the historic move, um, where the Preds play right now is Bridgestone arena, but the big building, as we used to refer to it, uh, the municipal auditorium. It's been around, I mean, forever. Flair Ever. won two world titles there, by the way. No way. Two? Yeah, he beat Ricky Steamboat in 89 there One. in Nashville. And then uh, Starcade 95, uh, he beat Randy Savage in the main event to become the world champion of WCW once again. I did not know. I did not recall the 95. Two, 
two world title wins there, three Starcades there, Hogan and Butcher on top, Savage and Flair on top, and then Hogan and Piper on top with uh, the NWO just really getting hot in December of 96. So, so and pretty- I can't tell you how many times I've been in the building, Conrad, for different conferences. Uh, I've watched the Harlem Globetrotters there multiple times. I've watched concerts there. Um, obviously, the first four outside of Huntsville shows in, in Nashville for TNA. It's, it's, it's got the historic presence uh, of, uh, uh, in town. Uh, obviously, coupled with, it's a, you know, we're the, the same weekend. Who would have ever thought that professional wrestling or sports entertainment would be holding a stadium show? You know, Nashville is going to be all eyes from the entire industry on Nashville, July 29, 30, 31. And 31 is a wrapping up to be a special night. And that press conference kicks things off this Thursday with the mayor. How about that? Uh, <laughs> the, the mayor of Nashville will be there. The rumor in innuendo is there's some other famous voices that might be a part Could as we well. Go ahead and drop that on them. Go ahead. Why not? To, to, to me, when you, when you j- just folks, there's going to be, I can't wait for the episode of Starcast Nashville Starcast when we do it sometimes in the next couple of years and Derek puts all the research together, <clears throat> but this press conference coming up, who's going to host it. So I'm sure I, I, my mind started racing Conrad, just the whole crew who, you know, so, but we need the voice. We need the, the, the voice of, of kind of Nashville or yeah, middle you know, Tennessee. Yeah. Just w- what is that vibe? Now you gotta, you just can't pluck a, a PA announcer or, or a newscaster or a radio host you need somebody special that respects the industry respects professional wrestling specifically respects Ric Flair and his career. So we got us an old boy mm. from up around K town. He's from Knoxville originally, but he makes his home in middle Tennessee right now. And he has won award after an award after an award for his line of work. And we are bringing to the press conference, none other than the voice of the Tennessee Titans. Mike Keith is going to be hosting the press conference. It's all just shaping up, man. It all the stars aligned. And so I'm damn hyped about that, you know, tighten up, but uh, no, Mr. Crockett's coming in. The nature's coming in. It's going to be special. We've got uh, representatives uh, from nonprofits coming in. They're going to be a part of everything. It's uh, the press conference to me, really yeah, tickets have been on sale, but we but kind of the event uh, uh, of the magnitude, it all kicks off Thursday. Can't wait for you guys to see the press conference should be everywhere. It's happening this Thursday at one o'clock. Hope you'll make plans to join us and central. Yes. One o'clock central. Thanks for that. I also hope that you're uh, in the mood to talk a little business because if you're the type of person who's always thinking about the new business idea or wondering what's the next side hustle I should spin up, well, here's a podcast recommendation for you. My first million. The hosts, Sean Puri and and Sam Parr, have each built eight-figure businesses and turned around and sold them to Amazon and HubSpot. Each week, they brainstorm business ideas that you can start tomorrow. These can be side hustles that make you a few grand a month or a big billion-dollar idea or really anything in between. One episode I loved in particular was episode 158, where Sam and Sean explained how to make millions by buying Michael Jordan's house and turning it into a museum. And if you love any of our business content we do on the show, I think you'll love this episode. They also chat with founders, celebrities, and billionaires and get them to open up about business ideas that they've really never shared before, including a conversation I heard with Rob Deerdick in episode 224. You'll hear about a guy who's built a $400 million media empire who's been tracking every second of his day for the last decade. So be sure to check out My First Million. That's My First Million on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy those podcasts. And we thank you guys for tuning in today to talk about our old pal, Monty Brown. With everybody talking about the 20 year anniversary of impact, I thought, man, is there a better time to talk about Monty Brown than not? I mean, this is, this is it right now. Of course, two weeks ago, we talked about AJ styles. That was a tremendous episode. Got lots of great feedback, but you yourself said, if you had to pick one guy who was the one who got away 
And sometimes we hear guys talk about that in their love life, but it exists in business too, folks. That was Monty Brown. I'm excited. We get to talk about him today, dude. You know what I was doing about 9 30, 10 o'clock last night. What's that? Watching, uh, watching Monty Brown's debut match. Really? And if you would have, if you would have asked me last week, Hey, did, uh, how'd, how'd Monty win the match? I would have said the pounce. Cause I, he was so ingrained and it was so unique just because of his lineage and Buffalo bills and new England Patriots and super bowl and all that kind of stuff. He used the, um, uh, a power bomb, uh, basically a set out power bomb as his first finish, but walk watching him walk down the aisle and we gave him a handheld mic and I'd seen videotape of him and knew he could talk, but man, he was super green. Um, and it, you know, he, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it was, it was really fun to go back and watch. Wow. Here's this raw talent that, um, mm, Time was not on our side, uh, but what a talent. Well, before getting into wrestling, Monty Brown played in the NFL first for the Buffalo bills, including super bowl 28 in 1994. And then the new England Patriots, he ultimately retires because of an ankle injury. And he's going to start training to be a pro wrestler by a rather interesting combination of folks. Dan, the beast Severn and Sabu. That's a, I understand if you're a Michigan guy, those are your options, but they had different styles. Fair to say. <laughs> Think about that. Dan, the beast Severn and Sabu. Uh, but no, the Michigan boys, um, lots of talent has come out of Michigan specifically with TNA motor city, machine guns, and we could go on and on and on, but, um, yeah, he was trained. Um, there are some unique stories about, I'll just say Monty's fandom in his playing days. I mean, uh, Marv Levy did a interview, uh, for us way back when, uh, different coaches that we had talked to trying to get sound bites to put, get, put together some character development packages. They all said that Monty was destined to be a pro wrestler. He loved it. He did promos in the locker room. And once you meet him around him, you can just see that as a teammate, I bet he brought not just a lot of talent, but a lot of energy and fun and excitement, not just on the field, but, but in the locker rooms and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, what a hybrid form Sabu, Dan Severn. I wonder if he's the one and only that had those two as his trainers. It's uh, reported that he even spoke with Paul Heyman at an ECW show and even chatted with WCW once upon a time about going to the power plant. Uh, and there's even a story about Ric Flair. Supposedly, while Monty was with the Patriots, he heard Rick was on a radio show, drove down to the station, and did his impersonations of Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan. And somehow, some way, he winds up in your lap. Did you hear about these old Ric Flair or Power Plant or Paul Heyman stories? Shout out, Derek. You did great research. No, I may have heard of it way back when, but I what what this episode right out of the gate took me back to Conrad. When we announced that J sports entertainment, that's the, as you know, the original formation, we gave an address to basically say, Hey man, we are looking for talent. Send us God almighty, man, this dates us so much, you know, send us a disc, send us a tape, send us anything you have on yourself pictures. We want to take a look at you. Monty saddled up and sent us stuff. And I can remember going, this guy legit played in the NFL for X amount of years. I mean, okay. So we know as far as checking the box of being an athlete, he's there. Uh, and then you just have one conversation and watch him. Okay. He, he at least has charisma. we got to put it together. So sign me up, sign me up. So Monty came on down early, early, early TNA. And he was so green then. So Monty uh, is 30 years old in the year 2000 when he debuts in Michigan's all world wrestling league against his then trainer, Sabu. Uh, he continues mainly on the independence in Michigan as alpha male. He first appears for NWA TNA in 2002. And, uh, you guys are probably trying to scour the earth here in late 2001 and early 2002, just trying to find talent. Do you know, you know, could you trace it all the way back to who was the first fan advocate, if you will, of money? You know, it came through that tape delivery. It, you know, we were getting, we, uh, 
the, the old address, Johnny Cash Boulevard, which is obviously, you know, the main road up here. Uh, the, our first offices, we just got is we were looking at as, you know, we, we knew that again, folks can't even really wrap their head around such an early day. There was no social media. So how do you find talent? Yes, the internet was there, but how do you really wrap your hands? Well, so you got to look at them. You can't go look at all these shows. So I don't know who opened the envelope or how it came about, about but and, and how it all came to be. But um, yeah, you, you just think about, I don't say that it's thrown in our lap, but uh, you know, Monty went out of his way. He wanted a job and did what it took. And he's working independence up in Michigan. That's how that, that was the nature of the course uh, of business back then. So he's going to very quickly become one of the, the standout faces of the company. I mean, did you recognize right away, you know, and I know you said that you watched his TNA debut and, and maybe we should just track the very beginning of that. Let's do that. Here we go. All right, in the ring, weighing in at 225 pounds from Nashville, Tennessee, Anthony Ingram. And his opponent, weighing in at 265 pounds from Michigan, the alpha male, Monty Rose. The beginning of that sounds like a nice thing. He's young, young Jeremy Moore, Ash, doing the ring introduction as he's stomping down the ramp here. And man, what a presentation. He just looks like a star. He looks like a pro wrestler. He looks like an action figure coming to life. Um, when did you know that this was going to click the way it did, or is it when you actually see the camera? promo at the bottom of the ramp uh he just you know grabs the microphone and, and basically calls a shot what'd you think and i remember knowing all right this guy's got charisma he's not afraid of, afraid of a microphone yes he's straight out of independence and hadn't had a lot of seasoning almost from the very get-go we all knew he needs ring time yes I mean, the bell starts you can tell he's very rough and raw and and i keep using the word green is no not a negative connotation. It means inexperienced. He hadn't had enough reps. Uh, immediately, we all knew that. And as you get into this, people don't realize that Monty was on the first few episodes, and then we knew, again, kind of the nature of the beast and what we're up against. We have a two-hour show, which is roughly six matches, and 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 to keep a turnover, and and you know we wanted Monty to learn and get seasoned. Monty had his, we'll call it first run, if you will. And then he went away for about a year or so. Uh, you'll probably have the dates here, but, but you know, him coming in, we knew there was something there, but it's, I, I don't know how many times the conversation I had with different talent through the years, Conrad, and, 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 you know, all of this with Slammiversary and the 20 year anniversary is I remember specifically saying, Hey guys, I wish we could season you and train you, but we, we literally are, that's not our business model. Right. You've got to go get reps on, on the, on the independent scene and get as many as you could. And that's where I first really dove it, dove in 2001, 2002, 2003, the independent scene. It's nothing like it is today. There's so much work out there today. It's, it's everywhere. That wasn't the case in 2002 at all. So, you know, he's clearly going to be, you know, programmed in, in a big way. I mean, he, his first, first time he touches the mic, he's calling out the top guy. 
Um, his next appearance, by the way, that was episode number three. It went down July 3rd, 2002. And I believe, uh, what we just saw there, if you watch the clip that we posted on social, that's from municipal auditorium, is it not? It sure is. Yeah. That was our, yeah. We went from Huntsville, uh, show one and two and three through 12, th- something wrong. I don't know. was municipal auditorium. So let's talk about uh, the next line here in the observer. Monty Brown came out as the black man who told truth. He had a bad attitude. He challenged him, but truth backed down, but truth called him an uncle Tom Brown attacked him. Brown should be in WWE developmental. If this doesn't fly, he's shockingly good on the mic physically looks great. And while he's green in the ring, he's very athletic and shows obvious major league potential. So let's a lot to unpack here. Uh, he, he definitely physically looks great. He is shockingly good on the mic for a guy who's really picked it up for the first time. He's clearly very athletic with an NFL background, but his charisma in the ring, not necessarily the moves or the way he puts matches together, but just the way he looks around at the crowd, it was very Sid. Like he just had this innate charisma. And we, we hear sometimes in wrestling, people say a phrase, like, I don't know what it is, but it was dripping off of him. That guy had it. And you could just tell that right away, but it feels like, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I can't help it. Why in the world when we're, we're really trying to debut the guy, we already have a race component. Is it because we felt like that crash TV is what we needed to sell pay-per-views? Because I don't think anybody would do that in 2022. So, so what do you, what, tell me what, what's your question or comment? Do you want well, to I, I, I'm just scratching my head about how right away, man, we think this, there's going to be something with this guy. I know what to do. Let's have him and another black man call each other. Uncle Tom. I got you. I got you. I, I, I thought you were saying, why didn't he get a shot here? I got you. But no, why, why was it gone this direction? We were yeah. building truth, not really justifying it here, but that's kind of the road. We, 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 we wanted to give money and edge, uh, get out the ledger heels and baby faces, uh, truth, great reaction. Really, really his it, truth's reaction in the early days was always not good, but star appeal good and creating the, the kind of the, the personal issue between them two. I, um, I don't know. It just feels weird. You know, the, and, and I get, you know, listen, it's a different time, different place. Let's not even think about all the crazy stuff WWE was doing in that era, but yeah, yeah no, is a swing and a miss. No, yeah. no doubt. I mean, swing and a miss. He only it's makes five great. appearances before he has a losing effort against the NWA champion, Ron Killings on August 21st, 2002. And then he lost to Sonny Siaki in his final match on this first run. And it feels like this was sort of hokey pokey. W- why did the bloom come off the rose with him so quickly? Uh, did you, did you ever consider since you do have this relative greenhorn who has this legitimate football background who has this great charisma, uh, but maybe he needs to be in short matches because he is still green. I think it would be easy to say, well, this could be TNA's Goldberg. Okay. And they're in, sorry, go ahead. And I cut you off and we go five matches and he's out of here. So we knew if not match one, not long thereafter, maybe match two, we got two choices. Are we going to make we'll call it a, a Goldberg esque, as you just referred to in my vision of, of, of mentality of that we did that with Joe, but Joe was ready for that. Joe didn't lose for a year and a half. When you wrap your head around that type of push and patience, I personally felt and others around right, Joe can handle this. He can win every match and, and, and not completely destroy the rest of your roster because Joe was seasoned. Money just wasn't seasoned. And so we made an early decision and the best of my recollection, because I really looked into the research and tried to did a little on my own, tried to figure out, I believe we made the decision off of that interview is let's, let's pour the gas on money. He's super green, but let's get a good win for truth out of it. And the Sonny Siaki, I don't know if it was just a body that we had to mix and match and get Sonny Siaki a win or build him or whatever it may be. 
but we knew that again, we weren't in the business of training guys. We needed, like Meltzer said, he needed to go develop somewhere. So you felt that way too, that he was probably like, if you weren't a promoter and you were his brother, cousin, neighbor, uncle, friend, whatever, you would have encouraged him to try his hand at WWE developmental. I would have told him, like I told so many guys go wrestle every night. If you have to do it for free, do it. You're getting a college education. You are literally learning your trade. Go get on the job site and work your ass off and do anything. It's the only way you get better. The only way. Well, we know that he's going to bounce around the Indies a little bit, uh, and then show back up in 2004, uh, I guess is the March 10th, uh, weekly pay-per-view. This is still uh, when we're running weekly pay-per-views and he's going to attack the insane clown posse. So or Detroit boys help me out here. Conrad, his last Sunday Siaki match was, uh, cause I want to give the timeline here. Just so that like, would have been uh, August. Oh, two. So yeah. So August, September, and he came back in March of the, uh, not Oh two Oh four. So he's gone for over a year. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So go I'm ahead. just yeah. trying to wrap my head around. Was it just cash and creative or, or, you know, you just knew, Hey man, this guy needs to be somewhere else. No, he needed to get reps without question. Cause when we brought him back, you'll see he was more seasoned. He was out there. We, I don't say we stayed in touch daily, but he was getting his reps. He did nothing wrong. I'll say that zero. We all loved him. We just didn't have the ability to invest ring time in someone. And he's not the only one. There's many folks that we just, Hey man, we, we just can't get into that business of investing guys, but you know, year and a half later, you, you'll, you'll kind of see, and it's, this is a fun part of the episode when we get into and the Fox sports match match. And anyway, I don't want to get too far ahead, but how, how does it come? How does it go about come about where he's invited back into the fold here? Because it feels like you knew there was something with the guy. Maybe, you know, you just didn't have the bandwidth at the time to help bring him along. I understand that we've, by the way, go out of your way to hear the early TNA episodes in our archives, especially with it being the 20 year anniversary. But you hear that. Candidly, Jeff's juggling a lot of, uh, flaming chainsaws here. So, Hey, we know that we, if we just focused on that, we could get this guy ready, but you know, we got to pay bills next week too. So I got to do that. And so, you know, the rough end drags here. And, and unfortunately that's Monty Brown, but we bring him back and he beats up the insane clown posse. I'm all for that. Uh, but, but chat me up and does he reach back out and, and say, Hey guys, how about another look? I've been working some Indies or do you guys say we need to follow up with him? There was something know, chicken, there. Or, chicken or the egg Conrad. I don't yeah. know exactly, but he was one of those guys that kind of stayed on our board, but when the spot's right, a lot of times as old Dutch used to say, it'll write itself. The opportunity will come up. Uh, I don't specifically remember the, uh, insane clown posse angle and why we chose Monty and how it to be, but they're all Detroit boys. It probably fit well in where we were going. And, and, and it just look when the juggalos would show up in the asylum, Conrad, you never went to any of those shows. Did you that the, the juggalo shows in no, this? No. Oh boy. Uh, uh, um, I, I, a different kind of fun was to be had, but a lot of fun. This island would be rocking. Throwing some juggalos goes to another level. Whoop whoop. <laughs> did you just hit us with two scoops of the whoop? I sure did. They go away. <laughs> okay. Um, his first match back is a week later, defeating Chris Vaughn, and Monty now has a gimmick where he's billed from the Serengeti. I loved he's, it, and he's going to wear leopard and tiger print style trunks. And, uh, you got to tell us about the character and what we really want to know is about the pounce. So watching that debut match and him not doing the pounce, man, I just went, Oh God, I'm mighty. Okay. So he came back with that, but the, the Serengeti and, and that's all money. That, that's a hundred percent what he wanted to do. He had the promo down. He said, here's my finish. Here's what I want to do with it. It was all hats off to him, man. He's a money's a smart dude. I mean, he's a thinking man, you, you know, pro football players, uh, they got an IQ cause, cause they know that you have to be able to a lot of it's instinct, but you still got to know what you're doing out there. And so money returned 
pardon the pun, but with a hell of a game plan, a look, a vibe, a promo, a new finish, and 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 we went with it. So over the coming months, he's going to get a nice push as a monster with a bunch of squash match victories. He's going to get wins over some, some names too, though, like Sabu, D'Lo Brown, Ron Killings, but he loses twice to Jeff Hardy in a number one contender match. So early on, he's at least put into a prominent position. And we saw that winning streak gimmick work with Samoa Joe, and I'm not comparing Joe and Monty, but we know, we knew that Joe could also wrestle Joe could go have a 60 minute match with a CM Punk and get a five-star rating from Dave Meltzer or whatever. But Monty Brown at this point, maybe not in hindsight. Do you think that whole Goldberg thing would have worked better on Monty? I don't just because it, it is, it cannibalizes your roster. If, 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 if the skill set isn't there and, and candidly, it's still, you know, two or three years in the business, four years in the business, you know, the reps, the amount of reps, you can really damage your roster. If the talent, you know, d- doesn't know how to get over without destroying your opponent. I think there's a craft and a skill set. That's why, you know, to this day, looking back on Joe's run in TNA, he was really special in a lot of ways. Cause you think about having a guy on the roster that goes undefeated for a year and a half. Yeah. You don't look at, oh man, he killed this guy's career or he beat this guy or he beat this. No, he always set it up, but Joe won with his muscle buster or the clutch or whatever it was, but it, it wasn't like, oh man, Joe doesn't have any more opponents because he's beat the shit out of all of them. No, Monty just didn't have that skill set, And we all kind of knew it. And I think Monty knew it, but with that being said, you just kind of give, gave that list that we're building Monty. We're going to build him slow. We're going to build him methodical. Time is not on our side because we want to get to the finish line much quicker than we can, but to get wins over Sabu and you listed a few other names and get right to a, a, a pinnacle. You think about Jeff Hardy in Oh five Oh six. I mean, brother <laughs> red hot. I mean, he was arguably top three, four, five baby face in the entire business. Yeah. So. Well, no argument for me. Um, I just know that in hindsight, that pounce thing, man, oh, that fantastic. It came out of nowhere. I mean, and it was consistent. It was a lot like blue chew. That's right. This episode sponsored by blue chew. The temperature isn't the only thing that's rising this summer. It's also your wiener. Blue chew is the hot tag for your wiener meat guys. Uh, Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredient as both Viagra and Cialis, but it's in chewable form and it's a fraction of the cost. You can take these dudes anytime, day or night. So plan ahead or be ready for a run in when an opportunity arises. Now the process is simple. You sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you get your prescription in just a few days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the USA. They're prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But I'm telling you, after one of these, you're going to be running in the bedroom, yelling pounce. Uh, if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code, my world at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is my world to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast and Jeff's wiener. Uh, Jeff, you've been using Blue Chew for a little bit now. And every time I try to FaceTime Mrs. Jared, it's all smiles. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> oh, Conrad. Uh, <laughs> you going to rip off something else of Rick's and start saying you're a 60 minute man or some shit like oh, that? You know, you ripped really? off the figure four, you oh. ripped off the strut. You're trying to claim his gimmick. You've, you've magically now shoehorned yourself in our Ric Flair press conference. I don't even know why you're there, but let's, let's call it. Let's all right. Let's get this on the table, pal. Okay. Mr. Promoter, Mr. Boss, Mr. There's no one that goes above your head. This, uh, four horsemen photo op at Starcast. Oh my God, Jeff. Are you really? Oh, have- uh, come on. You just took some jabs at me. Am I, or am I not included in it? No, we've got all the real horsemen there, except for, okay, that's a joke. Seriously. 
No, and sincerely, it's it's the Crockett era. We're, we're it's a Jim Crockett Promotions last show. I mean, we got David Crockett and Tony Schiavone hey, there. We got the old set. You weren't even on that. That this is for the big boys. This isn't the Nitro era horsemen. Silly. It's, it's silly. Though. Barry Windham was was there in Crockett. I don't I don't remember seeing you stretch your ass around and hold up four fingers on Crockett. But I Jeff, got my shirt on today. Lots I saw it's. A, I'm gonna be honest. You need to get it together because it's. God, you know, look at, look at all the success you have. I, I started the show by spitting in my hand for you and talking about it. it's been 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and isn't it great. And now you're just like, oh, I'm going to take this or Rick's too. <laughs> okay. Stop it. Stop it. Go read your comments on your Twitter. Uh, not yours, but sarcastic events about that. I don't, I don't even, I don't do that. That's okay. for Evan and those you, guys. I know. I know. Okay. Hey, so let's talk Ow. about your, let's talk about <laughs> Monty Brown here. He defeats Abyss and Raven in a monster's ball match at Victor. Oh, but Road. we didn't give him a push, right? That's where you're going with it. No, 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 not at all. I was just wondering again, I don't know anything about wrestling. You do. And I know that a lot of guys who have been in, involved in wrestling for a long time, they thought this Goldberg thing is going to be a failed experiment because if he can't wrestle and he can't lose and He's only over because he wins. Hell, anybody can do that. He's got to be able to tell stories. He's got to look vulnerable. We got to be able to get the heat on whatever. So I understand all that, but I've never had to have my brain work that way. I just knew, well, man, this guy has a lot of similarities with Goldberg. They could just do that. But as we saw once Goldberg lost, well, so did the momentum and his fandom was certainly never the same. Um, was that a conscious thought of yours that there's two sides of that Goldberg coin. Yes. You can become one of the hottest acts in all of wrestling as long as you're winning. But when you lose, if you can't do all the other stuff, what did we spend all this time investing in? Or did that not even cross your mind? So the Goldberg situation, when he beat Hogan, I mean, yeah. it, it just bingo. What a hell of a payoff. And I don't think they started. Well, you know, better than me. Cause you work with Eric uh, week weekend, week out. I don't think that was the original design. Let's get him, let him have 180 wins. No, it just happened. It, but all that momentum, but being around the industry and listening to the car rides and I've just, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but you got to know how to win and lose. Yeah. And Conrad just, uh, Monty had just kind of not had acquired that skill set yet, but he was way on his way. We, you're just talking about this monster ball. I remember having the conversation with Abyss about this. He's like, yeah, we can get money over because nobody thinks he's going to win. But, but so it wasn't, we didn't want to push him. We just thought again, small roster. If you have one guy that's untouchable, it really makes the math equation difficult every Wednesday. Cause we're still doing just Wednesdays. You got one guy on there and he's got to win every week. That equation gets a little bit more difficult, um, and it's more it's it's tougher on the talent. And look, Monty, um, I learned this lesson almost day one of the business. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the guy that gets beat has the ability to connect more emotionally with your audience than the guy who wins or the two guys sitting on the apron. That's just kind of how it. That, that's how the bit you would never think that, but that's really how the industry works. Yeah, you know, we've heard the phrase before as fans. That's not who goes over, it's who gets over, right? Yep, bingo. So he does win this three way, and everybody assumes Raven and Abyss is going to be a hardcore match. This was going to be out of nowhere for Monty Brown to win this one. Let's see what Meltzer says. The premise of this was stupid. They claimed all three were kept in a secluded room with no food or water for 24 hours under the guise it would make you mean. This was better than I expected. Abyss crotched Raven on the guardrail, and this was like a hardcore match on the show with a bunch of chair shots. Brown gave referee Mike Posey the pounce, period. Brown then gave, uh, Brown then gave Abyss the Oklahoma stampede, and the people popped for that. Abyss then got a, a bag of thumbtacks, and they teased forever that Abyss was going to superplex Brown into them. It wound up with Raven power bombing abyss onto the tax and the place went nuts for that spot. Raven knocked abyss off the apron through a table. As he turns around, Brown hits the pounce period. 
on Raven into a vertical table in the corner and gets the pin. And the timing of the two finishing moves was really good. Two and three quarter stars. So let's go step by step. What do you think of this whole well, the monster's ball, you get no food or water for 24 hours. Uh, it's an add on and creative, a little bit of storytelling gives the announcers a little more descriptive mindsets. Um, Hey Dave newsflash, this is scripted entertainment, pal, but I get it. it, it, yeah. it people don't want to get too far out of bounds of distorting reality. Uh, but God forbid the professional wrestling industry do this. <laughs> But yeah, it's just, a, it's a big match though, for money to get over huge, I mean, huge. because it, it is something that you would think, well, he's not going to win. It's a hardcore match and that's not his style, but he does it. It's Raven and Abyss's signature match. Yes, absolutely. And I want to mention you wrestle money for the first time on December 3rd, 2004. It's uh, on an impact. Of course it's for the NWA world title. And we know there's no chance you're losing that. Uh, so you beat Monty and I think at the time you could argue, oh man, they were just starting to push this guy. And then Jarrett, since this is a vanity promotion for him, cut him off at the knees. Now that's what people were saying. What really happened? What was your thinking here? Why was it the right time for you and Monty and for you to beat him? This was fun to go back and think through all this because so we started, this is December and we started in October, I believe. Uh, September, October, um, Fox sports net help me out. Conrad. I just, I, I think it's, I just remember we got on the air. You, you, you debuted June 4th, June. Okay. Wow. So June to June, then we started. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, regardless when, when we came on the air, we, we knew, and I say, we pronouns, pal, the creative team said, we need to make sure we're building folks because we're going to have some main event matches on TV and they've got to have story outside of our Wednesday pay-per-views. And so we would have never booked Jeff Monty at this point in a pay-per-view, but let's build him. And we kind of all sat around in the creative room and threw ideas around on different talent. And I'd, I'd love to go back, man, if I would have kept notes integrally back then, but it's another story, but it, it just came up that let's give Monty the shot and just see how it goes. And Conrad, I, I, I definitely remember when we did the match, the people, they were with it, man. They yeah. were really behind him. And I was really happy, super happy with Monty after the match, because I'm like, all right, this guy can go. Dutch was pulling his hair about because we were about to go too long because we were doing it live to tape, but the, the, the match it clicked. I was really happy with, with money after that. So he beats abyss the following month, at turning point in a Serengeti survival match. So you're giving him wins over big names, but then a loss for the title to you, but then his own gimmick match and he wins. So this was confirmation. I assume with the big boss for you to be in the ring with him, see how the fans are reacting. You know, you got something in him here. I mean, he gets another big win at the pay-per-view and before you know it, Pro Wrestling Illustrated even names him Rookie of the Year in 2004. And regardless of what you think of the magazine or, or its distribution by 04, that's still a cool thing, a cool feather in the cap to be acknowledged like this, especially when it's largely a weekly pay-per-view company. I mean, I know half the year in 04, you guys were on Fox Sportsnet, but it's not like it's primetime Monday night and, and he's still getting that acknowledgement. There was something there, right? And, and to me... Validation is probably too strong a word, but we're about to get into a scenario that we'll call it uh, a quasi power play that I was out of creative and dusty in. And that was really, in a lot of ways, not a good situation for Monty, but him. In the, I don't even want to call it a slow build because we were building money, you know, got those wins. He won the monster or the, the uh, Raven and uh, Abyss win. He comes back and he beats Abyss. That's all on a trajectory to we're doing hammer down, gas is on him, very figured in, very featured guy, knew that he was a star of today and even a bigger star of tomorrow. 
Um, but again, you, you joked about that vanity play. Um, Dixie, this is her first really early time, and I may be off by a few months, when she started to buy into it. I, I, me beating Monty was not received well by her. Because of the negative blowback. Oh, Jeff's winning this and winning that. I see. He should have never beat Monty Brown. No, in reality, we're putting him in the ring with the world champ. And yes. he took, uh, he, I, 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 I couldn't beat him. I threw the kitchen sink at him and he kicked out seven times. It took everything the world champ could do to beat him. It didn't hurt him at all. It helped him. And if you really want to roll the tape forward, he won rookie of the year. Not saying that's a, a, a big thing to cash into, but the validation that this is a featured guy and he's basically working on top to the alternative professional wrestling brand out there that is on TV. We were headed in the right direction with Monty big time. I believe. So we roll into 2005 and Monty's about to get the biggest push he's gotten thus far. Um, he's going to defeat DDP and Kevin Nash in a three-way number one contender match at final resolution on January 16th to face you later in the night. So just getting a win over DDP is a big deal. Getting a win over Kevin Nash is a, is a big deal, but to do it in a three-way on pay-per-view. Wow. That's a big deal. And of course, uh, you beat his ass with three strokes, um, in hindsight, was Monty just not ready or could this have been a worthwhile roll of the dice ready for what the world title? Like if he beats yeah. DDP and Kevin Nash, he, he won the rookie of the year. Dixie starting to buy into some of this. Hey, maybe we do need to get it off of Jeff, but if he beat DDP and he beat Kevin Nash, and then he somehow finds a way to beat you too. And he, he wins the big belt. Would that have been a worthwhile story or were there more things at play there that we don't know? Of? I, I just, who would have he, who, who would have he have wrestled? Who would have opponents been? Who would he have gone draw money with? If money was the baby face champion, what were the heels that were going to be able to make sure that he was protected as a baby face, but keep the belt on him. It, that's, that's kind of the, the menu, the, the hand that's dealt. So it's better to get him to the title match and he doesn't succeed for outside interference or the dirty dastardly world champ had to cheat to win. And then you just keep him moving. You let him win. You better have two or three opponents lined up immediately. And our business model just wasn't laid out that way at all. It's, um, again, subjective, creative decisions, but the decision was made. No, he's not ready for it. If that's the word used ready based on story, ready, based on skill, ready, based on contract status or ready based on all three above. And I'm going to add one more in not ready based on roster. Okay. Like, 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 okay, he wins. Now we're now what win. I got you. Yeah. So you needed, um, and, and listen, sometimes we, as we, as fans don't think about this, but as a guy who's in charge of creating the creative, maybe that's not the right phrase, but you know what I mean? Yeah. We've heard Bruce sometimes say, well, you make a list of your baby faces and you make a list of your heels. So if you don't have the right dynamic, okay, great. He won. He beat Jeff. He's got the belt, but who's he going to have matches with now? Who's he going to tell stories with now? It might not be so much that he's not ready. Maybe TNA is not ready. We, we, we weren't. And yeah. you kind of look at the, the, the situation right now, how long has Roman been champion to almost two years. It, uh, amazing. Whoever beats him. He, he I, and I will, we'll see, but I mean, you talk about being elevated, but there better be opponents ready for him. Right. Because knocking the big dog off the ledge. And he's a new, I don't say a new name, but you know, uh, first time champion or in that, you, you better have him lined up over there. Same with on the AEW side, you, you gotta, gotta be ready. How's it going now? They got the interim stuff, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's not the same set of circumstances, but in our situation and you hit it contractually speaking, and I added in roster and just, it's kind of an in-ring skill set. Uh, 
fact that we talked about Joe had that entering skill set, all the, all the above, but it wasn't like we were, oh man, money's just not going to work out for us. Hell no, he's the opposite. We were mentally still going hammer down. And those are the kind of conversations that I would have internally that would get so frustrating. I'm saying, guys, we're doing this, this in spite of what you believe we're protecting money. No, no, no. He should have won. Well, no, but the old wise owl says we need to protect him. He don't need to win it yet. A destination X on March 13th, he's going to face Triton and it's not good. Can't necessarily say that we uh, can blame him for that. Meltzer says it's hard to believe Triton applied for tough enough three and was turned down. Well, until the match started, he played power, man. He screwed up a press slam right away and dropped Brown on his shoulder. Brown did a very good job of trying to carry Triton, at least considering Brown's level of experience. The match wasn't that terrible, but boy, the finish was Brown gave the 300 pound guy a fall away slam and set up the pounce. The lights went out and they came back on and another masked man was in the ring and Triton was gone. He has the power to transport himself. It was Dennis Midian Knight who never unmasked and Brown gave him the pounce for the pin. Brown then saw Triton still on the ramp. Dusty had planned to make Triton a new version of Nikita Koloff but it's a different era and he was totally unimpressive dud. I know bus dusty's booking at the time. So it's not all something I can take you to task for, but chat me up Triton. Why didn't it work? Ryan, it's, it's his real name. Brian Wilson. Guy. Yeah. And look, um, it was, you know, really late December, early January, somewhere in that time frame where, Dusty was basically given the keys, uh, to, to run with it. Um, all kind of maneuvering and I'm not saying Dusty did, but Dixie and via her father, it, it, it was, a I don't want to say extremely uncomfortable, but there was a, a, a sense of maneuvering. My father was still around, but it was like, okay, don't fight city hall. Just l let it roll. Jeff, you're, you know, you're wearing so many other hats. Let, let Dusty write the show. Well. Dusty, when you kind of says, okay, here's your paint bucket and here's your couple of brushes, you got to go paint a new picture. What Jeff was drawing, obviously you don't need to follow down that path. Just like him, you better do something different or we're not going to do anything different. Keep Jeff in the seat. So he went down the road and he probably said, okay, Monty Brown, Dusty love Monty. We're building him, but let's switch him heel. Let, let's, cause that's the, that's the decision that was, was made switching Monty heel and Triton. Um, he, he just, again, wasn't ready. So very green Triton versus still kind of green Monty bad mix. It, it just did not click at all. And I get what Dusty was trying to do, try something new, but, uh, it was a serious swing and a miss. Well, what's not a serious swing and a miss is AG1 from Athletic Greens. I know what Jeff Jarrett did first thing this morning. Even before he got a shire, as he likes to say, he took one scoop of AG1, he put it in a cup of water, and he enjoyed some delicious tasting supplements. Now, I have to admit, I was using AG1 before they were a sponsor on our show. My wife studies all this stuff, and she knew she wanted better gut health. She wanted more energy. She wanted to optimize her immune system. She hated taking pills and vitamins. She knew if she was going to get me on board, I had to have something that actually tasted good. AG one checked all those boxes. Check this out with one delicious scoop of AG one. You're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogen to help you start your day. Right. This is going to better support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your focus, your aging, your recovery all the things. And I have to admit it exceeded my expectations. I've had some that were well, not awesome before, but I think we've settled in on AG one. And here's why it's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto or paleo or vegan or dairy or gluten-free, it contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial, anything. And oh yeah, it still tastes good. But more importantly for us, it's going to support better sleep quality and recovery. It's going to support your mental clarity and alertness. And by the way, you're investing in like an all in one nutritional insurance that Jeff and I really believe in, but don't take our word for it. They've got over 7,000 five-star reviews for athletic greens. And right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system 
with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash my world. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash my world to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And you probably needed a lot of that to beat up on uh, poor Monty Brown, like you were back here. But later in this same night, after this disaster with Triton, we're going to see Monty again. And this time he turns heel. He's going to cost DDP a world title match against you. And he joins your planet Jarrett faction with the condition that you're going to give Monty a title shot at a later date. Now, as a heads up, planet Jarrett consists of you, the outlaw, which is Kip James, Billy Gunn, uh, Larry Zabisco, Tim Welch, Chris Candido, the naturals and your lawyer. Uh, talk to me about planet Jarrett and why the decision was made to turn Monty Brown heel, or just when you, is it as simple as you take a look at your list of baby faces, your list of heels. Monty can have better matches the other way. Let's switch it around. It was a dusty concept, uh, as far as switching Monty, if I remember correctly, I don't know. I don't, I just don't remember specifics about how all that came to be. Um, the planet Jarrett concept that was used for a little while, um, was something that, that again, dusty, which look, I embraced it, it, it you know, because when you gave that list, there was, we were we were all very different. Billy Gunn, you just Candido. It, it was just kind of a list of here's not the entire heel group, but here here's a bunch of single heels. Let's all put them in a group with with with, with the champ is is essentially what it was. And plugged and played in and out. Uh, but the Monty Brown deal switching heel. Now look, hindsight's twenty twenty, but as a read the research and looked at it and kind of thought through things. And look, the contract situation is ultimately what it came down to, but this was without question is a big deal in not a very positive way creatively for Monty to switch heel. It, it just, it didn't work out. So Monty is, uh, going to leave the group. Uh, after we did a lethal lockdown on April 20th, it's going to be Monty and Kip James losing to DDP, Sean Waltman and BG James. Uh, and then over the summer, Monty and Kip are in a feud with the three live crew, uh, losing to them in the blow off at sacrifice in August. And that's when Monty leaves the group with the idea being that, you know, you two had an agreement and Monty never trusted you because you broke your word in hindsight was the experiment of Monty turning heel a misstep? I mean, it just wasn't a huge positive step. I, look, our industry, it's what have you done for me lately? That's you know, right. If it didn't real, if it, if it didn't work out on one show, you got the next show to restart things and recalculate or go in a different direction. And, and me and Monty had some, I thought compelling in rings because Monty could talk with so much conviction. Like when he said his promos, it's one of those things that, well, I almost said it, but I didn't want to cut you off earlier. The first time Monty got in the ring in Nashville, at the Minnesota auditorium, he looked like you were just saying he was looking around and this and that, and that kind of, I think you said a Sid look, I like yeah. to refer to it as he looked like he belonged. Yes. He looked like he belonged and was super comfortable. Comfortable well, is the right word. He looked comfortable. He, yeah. And when, when, when me and, and, and Monty were having these in rings and he's calling me the heel champ, Hey man, we had a word and you, you're not sticking by your word. You lying piece, you know, but Monty said things with super conviction. We had some really good in ring episodic nature where people could bite into it and emotionally grab onto it. So I don't want to say the heel turn was a, a, was a disaster. It didn't work on any level because money that's I'm tipping my cat to money can make just about anything work. Uh, but it didn't advance him is my point. It, it's really, uh, interesting to go back and take a look at this sort of step-by-step. Step. He winds up defeating Jeff Hardy in a number one contenders match at Genesis in November. 
Uh, he loses that honor to Christian Cage the following month at Turning Point. And Christian would go on to win the title from you later at Against All Odds in February. But before that, you and Monty briefly aligned back together with the storyline that you're both bitter towards TNA management. I don't know. In hindsight, it feels like when we read back through some of this stuff that Monty's sort of just sort of floating through the wind at the time. Does he have, has he lost his momentum with the fans? Has he lost confidence with the office? Um, where would you categorize him and his, his push here? If you will, the heel turn, he, we, you know, the baby faces. So, so he'll turn. So now he's on the champion side and a tag team champion side. And by default, he's at least number two heel. He can't be number one, anything because there's tag champs and, and single champ, but moved him over there. So the momentum from a creative perspective, the fans still loved him or loved to hate him. That momentum was there. But as you can kind of see, as we're going in it, that, that we, we realign, but then all of a sudden, like life happens, gosh, you can look at it. I could give you so many analogies through the years. Christian got added to the mix. Okay. That changes things. It does. It just changes things. And now as opposed to let's shoot an angle with Monty where he turned or Jeff turns on Monty and now Monty's a baby face. And now it's time for Monty to beat Jeff for the title. No, we've kind of got Christian here and got some momentum here and it's a hell of a story. And as we saw when Christian won that title for the first time, cause he had never won the title. And people had that emotional connection because felt he might not have got his just due over at WWF. So let's go with the Jeff Christian story. Nothing Monty did wrong, nothing creatively. It just didn't happen because the Christian Jeff story is what we all collectively decided to go with. I want to mention that uh, Destination X uh, we see in March of 2006, and we've got Monty. Uh, finally, uh, getting a title shot here, uh, against Christian it's Christian cage pinning Monty Brown in 17 minutes and 11 seconds to retain the NWA title. Meltzer would say the basic storyline going in was that Brown had injured cage with the pounce on TV and clay cage had claimed that he had broken ribs that were now taped up. What they did made sense since the match was built around Brown working on cages ribs, but it had no world title aura at all. It was really an example of doing everything by the old school book, but the crowd had seen so much fast paced stuff that the slow paced stuff was kind of boring to them. Part of it was also the personalities inside the ring. They weren't very strong. And even though both men are strong talkers outside the ring, Brown's big spot was dropping Christian's ribs on the top turnbuckle. And he continued to work the body. Brown went for an apparent suplex, but Christian gave him a series of headbutts and then used a senton bomb off the top rope for a near fall. Brown gets a near fall after a power bomb. Brown also uses an F five after a near fall and cage got out of the way of a pounce and hit the unprettier for the pin. In the end, the match was better than average, but not pay-per-view main event quality two and a half stars. So Monty finally gets a main event world title shot on a pay-per-view. It feels like, Hey, this could be it. And Meltzer just didn't think it was there. Is that just because of how strong, and I know you hate the, the phrase undercard, but the matches before them were clearly X division style and half, you know, high action and fast paced and things like that. And now they are trying to tell more of a story. Was that the issue? Is it that there's not that emotional connection yet with Monty Brown and the crowd? Why do you think this didn't click better? I guess I should mention this too. Okay. I believe in the news, Monty Brown had a knee injury. So even though in storyline, Christian's working with broken ribs in real life, Monty Brown is going to take some time off after this loss because get his knee he's, he, he's going to have to have a knee surgery. So okay. I get that, you know, we can't crown him here, but the crowd, it doesn't seem like there is with it as maybe on paper seemed like they would have been 30,000 viewpoint. Look, we yeah. switched him heel. We're rolling along him and Jared have a falling out, um, so to speak. So now he's an Island. I'm not aligned with him. So now he's got Christian and Christian is a brand new champion. So did anybody really think we were going to 
flip it the following month and we've got a four week build, it's kind of lack of a better word, the intelligence of our audience, they're not switching it off Christian last month, or I, I don't know if it was two shows before the ring filled up, the people went bananas when, when Christian won. So the old adage and, and look this at times, different folks be in creative rooms that they just kind of wouldn't wrap their head around it. And this isn't kind of this, this isn't the circumstances in every case, but in this case, I believe people don't want to see Christian lose period. So matter what they did and look at this stage of Monty's career, I'm not going to say his arsenal as a heel, when it was time to get heat, it's not like he did 20 or 30 spectacular moves. He, that just wasn't his skill set or his that, that were, where he was at in his career. So great emotion going in with the promos. But at the end of the day, people didn't want to see Christian lose, including Dave Meltzer. So it was just kind of a, hey, man, they tried hard. Couldn't follow what was happening earlier in the night because there were some uh, situations where, uh, you know, the outcomes of the match were maybe surprising or wanted to go one way or another in this case, Hey, Christian's got to go on last because he's the world champion. We don't want to see him lose. It is what it is. In hindsight, you know, I'd love to get the card right out in front of me, but just kind of playing devil's advocate armchair quarterback 20, 15 years later, we might've been better off not to put Christian on last, but then all of a sudden, Oh my gosh, his first championship first card. You didn't put him on last. You're disrespecting the title. I mean, it's, you can go so many different ways. So there's two, uh, pre-show matches, Shannon Moore and Cassidy Riley in the first one, David Young and Alex Skipper taking on shark boy and Norman Smiley in the second one. And then we start the show with Alex Shelley over Jay lethal Lance Hoyt over Matt Bentley team Canada, which is Bobby Roode and Eric young over the naturals, the James gang. Uh, with Bob Armstrong over LAX, which at the time was homicide machete and Conan. Then we got the uh, four-way match with Chris Saban beating Petey Williams, Sanjay Dutt and Puma. And then we have uh, abyss Jeff Jarrett and America's most wanted picking up a win over Rhino, Ron killings and team 3d. And right before our main event is the ultimate X match for the TNA X division championship with Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe and AJ styles. Also known as try and follow that motherfucker. Yeah. Look, uh, I didn't even know that. Uh, look, looking at the card that wasn't in the notes that should have gone on last. Yes. It, it kind of would have helped Monty. Yes. In, in his loss. Maybe people would have said, oh, you didn't take care of Christian and he's the world champ. And it's his, it's his first card headlining and you didn't give him that shot that the decision made is to put AJ on last. It's, uh, Damn it. yeah, I don't know if I matter about that decision or you not putting me in the panel with player. <laughs> I can't wait to crash the party. at starts. You're, you're not. Really yes, I am. Watch I'm going to, I'm going to get you a little baby trampoline and we're going <laughs> to put it out in front and you're going to get some little weights and people are going to ask, are you coming to Ric Flair's last match? And you're going to go, I'm not booked. <laughs> We're going to get you a dentist stamp 2.0. I'm not booked. Uh, I'd love to be there, but I'm not booked. I love it. But that's not new for you. Hell, they had a 20 year anniversary of something you created. <laughs> I'm not booked. <laughs> hey, don't look. I wasn't invited. Ain't that some shit, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> we got AJ Styles on that mug. We got Dixie Carter strutting around. What are you doing? Fishing with dad? <laughs> You mean the two fellas who started this thing who are right up the road on the lake? <laughs> I, what happened to the summer of no worries? This was the summer of no invites. There you go. Can't there get, you go. I mean, is on fire today. Can't get you to the horseman reunion. Not invited. Can't get you to the TNA reunion. Not invited. I mean, when, when they have a family reunion, do you get invited to that? No, I don't. <laughs> God, I know you were a heel, but damnation. And even to the family, right? <laughs> Holy. Well, Miss Deborah will invite me. You're always welcome in hours. I think you I know that. Nice 
sweet uh, email exchange. Uh, she wished uh, me and the the uh, the group of us guys happy Father's Day, and I replied back to her, Connie, and I said, I appreciate that, and please let Big Lair know to have a wonderful, happy Father's Day. She responded, will do. So how about that, pal? How about that? So after this uh, title loss, where you totally botched Monty Brown personally and individually, <laughs> he's going to take some time off for that knee surgery we talked about. Then he's going to have a bit of a feud with Rhino and Samoa Joe over the summer of 06, but that's essentially it for TNA. Yeah. He does have a short run in WWE and TNA or WWE as Mar Marcus Corvon. That happened in 07 on the ECW brand. He was even on a WrestleMania match, teaming with our old pal, Elijah Burke, uh, Kevin Thorne, who I think now is a realtor role title, Matt yep. and Matt Stryker as the new breed. They're going to lose to the ECW originals, RVD, Tommy dreamer, Sabu and the Sandman. And it turns out his final match was losing to none other than CM Punk on June 19th, 2007. Wow. So on the 15 year anniversary or the five-year anniversary of, of TNA. He has his last match 15 years ago. I just think that's uh, so special to me that his last match is June 19th. I mean, it just feels like Monty Brown is like one of those great. What ifs and I know a few years ago, people were all up in arms about the lost tape of Tom McGee and all that. And I appreciate that, but Monty Brown, man, like that dude should have been top guy in the WWE he should have been a top guy in TNA. And I know that you've had some really honest conversations on some of our live shows. You and I've been fortunate enough to do a few of them and, and Monty Brown always comes up. We always do get a question about Monty Brown during the Q and a, yeah. and you were really honest during one of our meetings uh, or, or one of our, our shows. And you said, guys, I mean, here it is. I, I knew as a, as a, as a businessman and as a, as a promoter, if I want to be selfish and think about me, I needed to keep Monty Brown. But at the same time, I knew, boy, if I was him and I could take my promoter hat off and put my, my wrestler hat on, he really needed to have a shot to just see what it's like in that machine. That is WWE. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't, but to not give him that opportunity is probably short-sighted. And you were pretty honest about those conversations you had with Monty. Take us through that, where you're trying to wear both hats of, I want to look out for him. I want to look out for me, but I also know, man, if I was him, dot, dot, dot. Orlando double tree hotel, right across from universal studios. It was the, where the company stayed at. When you walk in the big sliding double doors, right before you walk in right to the left is a park bench. And we would do our tapings, uh, at the impact zone. And then we'd all come back over and, uh, you know, obviously the bar was open, but people would eat dinner or people would go next door to Friday's. But anyway, there was a lot of motion in the lobby and the restaurant Friday's was next door, all that. But me and Monty decided to have a little seat outside and we talked candidly about the renewal of his contract and it was as open and honest and look. I, I was doing everything in my power to let him know we cannot match WWE's offer, not even close, but we can. And I gave him my experience in my entire career. There once upon a time, Monty, that I got offered good money, probably triple what I was making, but I wasn't aware of it. And I could have gone to WCW and my dad turned it down without me knowing, <laughs> but that worked out for me because I wasn't quite ready for it. Now, money, I'm not here to tell you, you are, you aren't ready. I do know the more seasoned you get, the more valuable you're just investing in that money round bank, investing in that money round bank. So you're going to make your own decision, but I gave him an honest, Yes, it was a negotiation. And look, he was wanting to get more money, but I knew the ceiling I could go. I knew exactly what Dean Broadhead and Bob Carter and Dixie and whatever else that number was. This is this is what we're comfortable offering, which made my job easy because once I kind of know a number, okay, guys, that's it. But hey, um it 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 was what it was, and he 
rightly so. Look, uh, we started off this episode. When you think about a guy starting in this industry from Sabu and Severn at 30 years of age, I started wrestling when I was 18. I I'd, I'd, had 12 years, you know, and other guys start in their early 20s. So Monty was out collecting paychecks in the NFL as opposed to getting seasoned in this business. So he got a start, late start. So that was another card that was discussed that, Monty, I get it. You have a window. I get that, you know, Vince and, and company, it's a young man's game, and they want to get you in their system and teach you and train you, and you're not going to go there tomorrow and become a star the very next day. I mean, I don't, I didn't have the, 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 you know, I, I didn't have the opportunity didn't present itself, but we talked about AJ Styles a couple of weeks ago and Conrad, the feedback that I got from that, from people didn't know a lot of that. They knew some of that story, great feedback, but look at AJ Styles. He had done 15, 18 years until he debuted at the Royal Rumble. Yeah. That made a monumental difference. So that was my pitch if you will to Monty and he wanted to give it a shot and I'm like dude I respect the hell out of it where you're at in your life give it a shot and as you as we saw as time went on when it was time for Monty to go home and take care of family and nephews and nieces and drill in and and really the integrity and the character of the human being Monty is it showed for the whole world to see didn't work out at WWE but he he didn't keep on and hanging on to this business he got out and took care of family, but, um, Hey Conrad, let me ask you in maybe a Bruce pod kind of trying to think, I doubt Jr. but maybe, yeah, maybe Jr. What happened with him on the flip side up there at WWE? Why didn't it work out? Was it ECW? I'm not going to blame it on the brand, but that what happened? You know, uh, we talked a little bit about it. I know he had some family stuff going on. I think it was just, he got out of the race car too soon. You know, I mean, you look at some of the, the less than awesome creative that other talents have survived in wrestling, uh, whether it was TNA or WWE or yep. WCW, like, I mean, you, you've been a part of some silly shit and it worked oh, out cool. okay. So I can't necessarily say it was one piece of bad creative. It's not like there was, and I'm not saying this to be funny. There was not a Katie Vick incident where it was like, well, there ain't no coming back from that sort of deal. Uh, I just think it was one of those things where, you know, you, you probably see what it's like to be a WWE superstar on TV and you read interviews about it and you, you read magazines and, and you read books and you hear people talk about it and you watch it on TV and you watch the pay-per-views and you see the action figures, but I don't know. I've never talked to Monty Brown, but I imagine that WWE travel schedule. It's unlike what he did when he was in the NFL or when he was with TNA. And I think there is the idea of, and, and I've known people who had relationships like this, where they really wanted to be with this man or woman, but what they really wanted was to be with their idea of that man or woman, not actually be with that person. And I think sometimes that is the case for guys who see what this is and they sort of have in their mind's eye, what it is. And then they realize, oh, you mean I'm in a hotel 300 nights a year and I'm on an airplane or in a 300 mile car ride every other day. That's probably not what his experience was like in the NFL. I'm not saying that wasn't grueling. I'm just saying the travel stuff, there is no off season in wrestling and the travel component of WWE schedule, not now in 2022, but back then that would run a brother ragged. Would it not? And, you know, I was just sitting here thinking counter ad different folks that have, um, that experienced from a short period of time. Uh, I just did a live event, uh, for WWE and, and I'll just say hearing the different conversations and stuff like that. You know, one thing that is kind of like a, um, it goes so far under the radar, but it, 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 in a lot of ways, it's a game changer and you see different guys carrying different coolers, but just the fact of how you have to think about how you're going to eat. If you're health conscious, just your eating ritual and situation on the road, it, it, it's not easy to navigate. If you're right. going to put the amount, right amount of calories and you're not going to eat fast food, you know, twice a day and 
all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I go, I can see, you know, T TNA, um, it, we, you know, until about Oh six, when we started running all the live events, we were that Wednesday, Thursday company. And that there, there's a huge difference when you go full time. I mean, just to, you know, you, you, you hear different folks at AEW right now. They, they love it because they know if they won't, they have weekends off. That's a, that's, that's a game changer. <laughs> so yeah, I, I can see Monty, um, that not working out, but I never, I guess I've never really asked like what happened on the end, but, uh, did he, did he get released? No, he left. Okay. Okay. No. Wow. Wasn't for him. Well, I know what you're saying. Uh, yeah, that, that probably came out wrong. Yeah. Time to move on. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy to think too, because June of 07, there was so much happening. Um, wow. You put, you picking that one I'm putting up or putting down. Oh, unbelievable. So his last match is June 19th and Chris Benoit passes away, kills himself and his family, June 24th. Wow. And so if you're taking, I'm I, again, I'm not a wrestler. I wasn't there. I don't even fucking know Monty Brown. Yeah. But I know if there is some sort of family thing he's got going on and he's away from him all the time and it's not going as awesome as he probably imagined, like. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine, because as a fan of his, I imagined his 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 ride would be a lot different too. And I'm sure when you had the confidence in yourself to succeed in the NFL and play in a dog on Super Bowl, and you hear all this critical praise, and you hear the crowd reactions, and you finally have an opportunity to get out of the smaller sandbox and play on the big stage, it might not go like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you hear that news. It's got to recalibrate something where you're like, what am I really chasing here? Yep. And wow. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that that had anything to do with no, it, but it, that, that's, but that's their days of their days apart. Yeah. That, that's why they uh, doing the podcast sometimes is so enlightening. Cause I would have never gone there because this episode's about money. And we, you know, I've said it in one-on-one, -on -one, I've said it on stage shows. He's the one that got away. And, and I want to be clear. Cause I know what I just said, everybody's going to quote. I want to make sure I'm giving the proper context. I'm not saying Monty Brown left wrestling because of Chris Benoit. No, I, I am just reminding people that he had his last match just five days before Benoit left this earth. And, and we know for sure that he was dealing with family stuff and we know for sure that he had to be missing his family. He was working all the dog on time. I mean, that was just the nature of being in oh. WWE and you have to make some choices. And if one that may have been a dream, ain't really working out very dreamlike. Yep. Maybe you make a different decision. Yep. For sure. Interesting. If you had to do over again, and I know you said he's the one that got away. If you had to do over again, it sounds like if we could armchair quarterback, this thing a little bit. You wouldn't have turned him heel. Yeah. And that was a dusty, uh, direction. Is that I it though? Is there anything else you would change or just that? If Should I he have beat you for one, one of those times for the belt? So, so, so let me get critical, super critical of myself. I hate to say regret, but, but we're playing armchair quarterback. And if yes. I could go back and what I know now, I didn't know then that's a country song, but here's what I do. I'd say, Hey, Carter family. I kind of think Monty Brown has shown all of us. How can we lock him down long-term? Do, can we, can we, can we look at this as, well, I don't want to take it out of a, cause all right. So Conrad, you'll get this. We had a show budget that we didn't go over. My hand was slapped multiple times. Nope, not going over. Nope, got going over. Nope, not going over. So we had the show budget. So you have to kind of handle that with kid gloves week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out. But if I had to go over, Conrad, I'd probably gone to the Carters and said, can we take some money somewhere, somehow, not out of the existing budget and get him locked up, knowing 
okay, we've got him. Let's go with it. Maybe. I'm not asking you to um, to tell me exact numbers. How how far off were you? Jesus, I would really have to. I'm going to be way off, but I mean, because here's my thing. I, I understand probably probably hundreds of dollars on a per show basis, but not not any normal <sighs> than that. I know not in not enormous amount, but over 52 shows. It's a $15,000 bump, maybe. Let me ask this. Uh, people wrestle for different reasons. And I know that people are going to hear that and they're going to want to argue that. And everybody's going to want to say, oh, so and so is a mark or whatever. Fuck off. <laughs> people wrestle for different reasons. Here, let me, let me explain. There's not going to be a situation where I could be wrong. But I don't imagine there's a situation where Brock Lesnar is 60 years old and he still wants to make a spot show like Jerry Lawler did this past weekend. Yeah. Lawler loves wrestling. He loves getting paid, but he loves being the king. He loves performing. Uh, the same can be tr said of, of my father-in-law. Yep. Rick's cameo is more than his WCW contract ever was worth a Google. He's still, he's got a million dollar contract with Fitterman. That's not a secret. Uh, the dude is doing better financially than he ever did in wrestling. That's just, he, so he's not wrestling because he needs the money, which is a narrative out there. He's doing it for the glory because he loves it because he wants to do it. And this is a guy who was in Monty Brown, a professional athlete who played in the NFL, who made NFL money. Now, no, he didn't get a Tom Brady level contract. I'm not saying he did. But I am saying it's probably not a circumstance where Jeff, I need a couple hundred extra dollars to pay my utility bill. And I'm not making light of that. I'm just saying people wrestle for different reasons. Sometimes you just love it. Sometimes you just do it because it's all about the money in the miles. And I've heard both and I appreciate both, but I know wherever, wherever Jerry Lawler wrestles next, it's not because he really needs it to pay his Lexus payment. I can't you that. No. That's not the reality. He's doing it because he loves it. And I'm just wondering, do you think that he didn't have faith and confidence in TNA? Because could the WWE wave a bigger checkbook? Certainly. Could they afford to pay it more? Certainly. But I'm just wondering in hindsight, if you went with him and, and you, you acquiesced to him creatively and he, he got to be the champion and be the top guy and be the face of the promotion. Did you, did he strike you as the type of guy? who would have wanted to check that box creatively and been the big fish in a smaller pond, or was it just all about the money and the miles? Wow. That's why you're the pod father. So if I remember correctly, Monty played six seasons. You got to play six to get retirement. So he had a check coming down the road. Yeah. So he wanted more money from us, but rightly so. But as you roll that out, you know what? It just really, the light bulb went off because let me, I'm really not going, uh, telling you my complete thought here. Here's the situation. Monty never bitched about creative. It's, it, it's not like he said, Jeff, I want to win the belt or I want to do this. or I want to do that. He was very much coachable, very much teachable. I might go as far as to say he's a model talent because he spoke his mind in matches and, Hey, I'd like to do this. And I like to do that. Or what do you think about this? But at the end of the day, as Dutch would say to any talent, Bobby Roode and Eric Young used to laugh about it, but it'd say, boys, just run the play. And that was a easy way of saying is it's great for all us to collaborate, but now we're at the line of scrimmage down said hut, everybody run their routes make their blocks, make their cuts, run the play. Monty was unbelievably great at that. At the end of the day, the time had come that he was getting a real look-see from WWE, the bright lights, the big city. He grew up loving flair and all the stars of the nineties and everything that went with it. He wait a minute. Wait a minute. He grew up loving flair. Remember the flair comment doing the flair interview? Yeah. I'm just saying just clicked, you know, brother's only 52 years old. Pouts. 
In Nashville? <laughs> Listen at you. Just saying. Uh, By the way, he played four seasons. He played 93, okay. 94, 95 with Buffalo. 96, he was with New England. Uh, and, and listen, he had a fair, more than fair career. I mean, let's think about how often guys even get this opportunity to play oh, yeah. in the league. I was wondering if he got retirement money. That's where I was going with it. But yeah. I, my point being was I don't ever – he was wanting more money in the contract uh, up. But even if we would have gotten – here's a hypothetical and a what if – Let's just say we would have gave him a 30% bump and we were willing to give him a 10. If I had to talk to Carter's in, Hey, can we give him a 30% bump or whatever that number was? He might have still turned us down because he wanted a shot at WWE. I don't know. And, and, and the reality, I get that. Like there's so do. many wrestlers who grew up and me and you've talked about it before. You grew up a little Hulkamaniac. Like I had the action figure in 1990. I had an ultimate warrior birthday cake. Uh, so I, I'm just saying like, I'm, I've been a big fan my whole life and I'm not saying this to be ugly. I, I didn't, when I was a kid, I didn't pretend I was TNA tag team champions. Cause that wasn't even a thing. Yep. And so if you could grow up and not necessarily, you know, be a main eventer in, in wrestling for TNA, but just be on a WrestleMania, I'm sure that might check a lot of guys boxes, but I just got the vibe or I hope maybe it's who I want Monty Brown to be. I, I love to think about the idea sometimes. What if you guys just would have went with him? Yeah. And maybe it was too soon and maybe that would have backfired too. But as a result, we never really knew. And he is one of those great. What ifs and great story. Yeah. And by the way, I, I saw some comments when we, we asked for questions we're going to do some of those people were like, Hey, was this TNA's Ahmed Johnson? I mean, I, I don't see that at all because I mean, Johnson was not a strong promo and, and Monty Brown was charisma wise. There's no different. Now, if you want to say, are they jacked up black dudes? Okay. Well, that's easy, but we gotta be better than that. And, and I can see where some people would say, well, Ahmed didn't really have the, it looked like he was going to be a bigger deal. And then he really wasn't, but he developed a reputation for hurting guys and things like that. And again, I wasn't there. I don't know. You never heard anybody say anything like that about Monty Brown ever. Um. No, no I agree. it's just a shame that we don't know what it could have looked like. Cause it is kind of fun to think about, you know, if he came along, I know we're saying timing's everything. And even now dude's only 52, but imagine if he came along in the last five years, I think Vince would have ate him up in a minute. Cause that, you know, when we look back over the TNA, um, it's like any territory, like. You know, Dusty worked some territories that he wasn't the main event. Um, Sting and Ultimate Warrior finished up in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and Warrior went to Dallas, and Sting went to Watts. And within <laughs> 18 months of that, they're both world champions in the major companies. And my dad said, guys, you've kind of run your route here. Uh, you you got to finish up. They didn't even know what finish up meant. Yeah. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, when you look at Sonny Siaki and I mean, we could go through a list here. Hey, they, they, it just didn't work out. But on the flip side, AJ styles, first ballot, Hall of famer, Samoa Joe. I mean, we could go on, we could go. It's just, it's the fun part and the nature of the business that you look. And for me as a talent, not so much as a producer or executive producer or promoter, but as a talent, you just think timing is everything yeah it is everything it really is and i wish the timing was right and i wish that he would have been at the tna anniversary and he would have pounced to your ass out of the ring that i wasn't there gone. he wasn't either <laughs> um mitchell barnett wants to know uh jeff it always sounds as if monty is the one who got away and ultimately never hit what you believe was his true potential excluding monty who else is on your mount rushmore of wrestlers that never reached their full potential and he gives an example. His first nominee is Buddy Landell. Oh, that's a good name. Oh, but, but man, so he's going all complete Billy Joe Travis. Your and boy, he, you loved you some Billy Joe Travis. But he was a working son of a gun. Um, he was his own worst enemy. He'd tell you that if he's alive today, he'd tell you that. Um, but man, I'd have to really cast in a wide net. Brad um, Armstrong. Bingo. 
this. I mean, you, you're probably going to so, be. So Brad Armstrong and Monty Brown are on mine. I, I would, I would certainly appreciate Buddy Landell. I yep. can appreciate that potential. Uh, a guy who I've always thought, two guys I thought were way ahead of their time are Steve Carino and Chris Candido. You know, those guys were, were came along and had their quote unquote run at a time when size was much bigger deal than it is now. But if Candido or Carino were running around now, people would be loving their stuff, dude. Yeah, good. Well said. Is there another? I'm just trying to think of that that um so much talent in the early nineties. Um I mean, you know, I, I used to love the idea and I used to give Bruce shit about this all the time. But if they would have went with Mr. Perfect as the top heel. Oh my goodness. Well, that so when you look at late eighties, early nineties, the, the most of those guys in their mid thirties to late thirties, they grew up in the territory system and really were super skilled. And then the guys that even came on later, like, uh, uh, this is a bad example. Maybe a Tom zinc, great looks, great work. Um, but he, did he realize, he connect. That, yeah, so maybe that may not be the best example, but there, there are, there are several, several, several that I look at that go, okay, they were seasoned. They could work. They could talk. If you're uh, talking about timing, I think you could also throw Barry Windham on the list. Sure. By the time Barry got the big belt, it was like just the big gold belt. It wasn't really the world title too late. If they would have went with Barry in 86, 87 before he joined the horseman. And I understand they went a different way and, and it worked out, but I'm with you though. Man, yeah. good one. That's a really good one. Yeah. You guys hit us up on social, uh, at my world pod. We want to hear, you know, who else is on that Mount Rushmore, your Mount Rushmore of wrestlers that never reach their full potential. And by the way, I think in everybody we named what Monty's fault, uh, what Brad Armstrong's fault, what in Barry Windham's fault. It was just timing. timing. And, and um, you know what, looking at this last night, it's not like there was a, uh, oftentimes in sports or entertainment, even on movie sets, you get a new producer director and their whole crew is wiped from the face of the earth and somebody new in. There was a regime change from Jeff and team to Dusty and team. And that team was kind of the same, but in that influx, Dusty wanted to go with Triton and he knew he liked Monty, but we're going to try Monty. But man, that heel turn that night, that, that didn't get off to the greatest of start. And the momentum, the air began to let out, not because Dusty didn't like him. It just didn't work out. Not good timing. Uh, lots more questions here. Here's one from Nick. He wants to know, uh, Monty Brown started in 2005 with a lot of momentum, but was abruptly turned heel at the destination X pay-per-view in March. As a 14 year old kid and huge Monty fan, I hated everything about this was Monty resistant to the idea. And what was the thought process behind turning Monty heel at the time? I know you said that was a dusty call, but we didn't really talk about cause you, and you did say Monty was like a model employee. Was he resistant to this heel turn? To my knowledge? No. And he liked to be a heel. He, he, I mean, I can remember our in rings and just hanging out and working in a lot of ways at his core as a performer, money, liked being a heel, um, he just did. So it, it wasn't something that it going against his grain at all. So, uh, let's talk about the pounce tons of questions about that. Matt wants to know Jeff, who came up with the pounce and do you think Monty deserved a big push in WWE? I think we both know the answer to the WWE one, but the pounce An another question here from chase. Jeff, I'm curious, how did it feel to take a pounce from Monty? Did it hurt all that much? Was it fun to take himself for the crowd? Give me all there is about the pounce. You know, great finishing move. His football pedigree, it's like. Um, Who gave it know, to him? Or he come up with it on his own? That's all, it's all Monty. It's all Monty. You look at uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan used to get down to the three-point stance because as good old our good old buddy JR, uh, you know, it would bring in Jim's legit football pedigree and he's a wedge buster and all that. So different moves that kind of fit different person's skill set and everything. Monty's a, obviously an NFL football player. So his blowing through uh move that was raw and not smooth at all in a great way, it just fit him and you better be ready to take it. 
And sometimes it was a matter of you're going to take it. It's just, are you going to be prepared for it? There, there was no, uh, here it comes. Yeah. And there's no sandbagging. You're, you're going to get hit. So get ready for it. Uh, and if you weren't ready for it, it hurt a hell of a lot more as opposed to, I'm going to come off the ropes and I'm going to be ready for this. And, um, it's a massive change of direction move. <laughs> you, but, you better be ready. And I mean, cause it, I mean, it's, it's like we see every Saturday or Sunday in football, right? I mean, that's what it is. Feel real to me. Damn it. <laughs> the bounce is, and, and there's no telling what's worse, the impact for money or the impact of the map, but either way, it's a, it's a lose, lose proposition. Uh, Chase Lamar says, Jeff, I'm curious. Uh, no, we, we did that one already. Bryant wants to know, uh, at this time, there was no secondary championship in TNA. Do you think had there been one that that could have been something Monty benefited from? Now that is a good answer. Uh, now, of course there is an X division champion or question. You know what I mean? That there is a, an X division title, but that's not really like a U.S. title or a TV title or an intercontinental title or what have you a secondary title though. Could that have worked for Monty? It absolutely would, would have worked for money to back up from that. The philosophy in boardrooms and marketing meetings and the vision of the company, the kind of the mindset was, how are we the alternative to, of the WWE? The WWE is heavyweight secondary belt, IC and tax. They didn't really have a women's division. Hey, we're different. We've got four divisions, heavyweights, tags, knockouts. X division four distinct. We didn't want to add a secondary belt later. Russo wanted to add the, the legends belt because we had some veterans on the roster and I kind of saw that vision. It said, so it didn't, but anyway, but to, to the question, great question. And I do believe it would have benefited money. One last one. Then we'll wrap it up. Mike wants to know Monty Brown was one of my favorites during the FSN era of TNA. I remember an NWA world title match between Jeff and Monty on impact in late Oh four. And I remember really rooting for the alpha male. And I was so pissed off when Jeff won while I enjoyed this as a kid coming home from school to watch, I still think this match could have been a great pay-per-view at the time. Was this match done to boost viewership, the fledgling impact show and, or could you picture Monty winning a rematch on pay-per-view somewhere down the line? Now, this is a great question, Jeff, because you're buying the time. So you're not really dependent upon ratings. I understand that you still want people to watch. So they'll buy your pay-per-views and whatnot. I mean, you definitely need to sell them DVDs and merch and I get that, but it's not as if we have a television rights deal and we're incentivized to pop a big rating and still, we're still trying to do a little old school. No, we're not selling tickets because we're running in a soundstage, but we are trying to sell pay-per-view. Did you think? giving this away on TV was a mistake then, or now with the benefit of hindsight, would you have saved it for pay-per-view? Uh, kind of a, an appropriate time to give, uh, the answer to this. Are you aware of what the last episode of SmackDown did? Numbers wise. I think it was up. It was way up. Yeah. Roman riddle kind of a, well, there was some other stuff on that show too. Well, there was, but the second hour, the highest rated quarter hour of the show was the last, right? So the people tuned in and stick around to watch. And I'm not given it's the exact analogy. I say all this to say we had an opportunity to build an incredibly credible baby face. He's on the upswing. He's building, got the heel champion. How can we have a NWA world title match on TV? that means something, but we're not given out, given away our pay-per-view episodic storyline match. So we were trying to serve multiple masters. And in this case, I love that the writer on Twitter said, I was so pissed off. And I thought to myself, Hey, Conrad, we're going to do this podcast, Jeff. They hate your guts. Why would no? <laughs> but yeah, you know, so, so it worked. The byline of his tweet was, damn, I was pissed off. Um, uh, uh, you know, Monty didn't win. They didn't it worked. say it. it worked. Yeah, it worked. So it worked for Monty. It worked for the television show. And it worked in other business avenues because it was a building block for all parties involved, including the championship. 
Well, next week we're going to be talking about Slam Anniversary 07. The show goes down in Nashville. It's dubbed the Massacre in Music City. It's got TNA's world title being determined by the King of the Mountain match with Chris Harris, Christian Cage, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, and Kurt Angle. We've also got Abyss versus Tomko, Sting versus Christopher Daniels, Team 3D versus Rick Steiner and Road Warrior Animal. Oh, and how about this? Frank Wycheck of the Tennessee Titans will also wrestle. And Jeff will also be talking about some tough news. Unfortunately, next week, and I'm not trying to make you cry, but it's probably going to happen. This is unfortunately where you lost your wife, Jill. And there's a lot going on professionally. There's a lot going on personally. It feels like that's a theme here on the show, uh, but you've been really honest and open and transparent with our audience. And I'm excited for us to talk about this one next week is uncomfortable as it may be. We've uh, shared a lot of uh, wisdom and a lot of the stuff you've learned through this road to being this fully evolved, a better person that you've become in recent years. Uh, did you ask me a question that, you know what the, um, just saying slam anniversary of seven. Yes. We're going to talk about the wrestling. No, the, but the, the poster for this, uh, it's a throw off on, um, walk the line. Yes. There you go. God almighty. Good recall. I could, but anyway, uh, I love the art when they, cause they started talking about this months in advance of, you know, slam anniversary, j- just the, the whole vibe of it. It was cool. It was really cool. The five year anniversary of the show. Of course, we just passed the 20 year anniversary of the show. Uh, but man, so much going on in 2007. Can't wait for us to talk about it next week. And of course, everybody's going to be talking about a little press conference. As you're listening to this, it's two days from now, Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Uh, we've got the mayor of Nashville. We've got uh, Mr. Crockett. Mr. Jarrett's going to be there. I don't know why. Uh, Mr. Flair will be there, of course, and we've got the voice of the Tennessee Titans joining us. Plus we'll have some great charities on hand. We're, we're announcing some really cool stuff. Yes. And, um, I don't know when this will post to ad free shows, but by the time everybody else hears this, you know, that we've just added another superstar to the Starcast lineup and it's a panel and a meet and greet, not giving a spoiler here, but just follow us online or just hurry over to starcast.com. That's S T A R R C A S T.com. I want to remind you, Jeff, we're doing something different that we haven't done for any Starcast in the past. We're accepting mail ins. So if you can't, for whatever reason, make it to Nashville, you can still get your stuff signed. Oh, wow. I, I've been talked into this for the very first time. It's never been possible before. I want you to be in Nashville because wrestling history will be made. I don't know if you saw this past weekend, but Nick Wayne tore it down with Will Ospreay, who a lot of people think is the best wrestler in the world that happened at GCW. They're bringing psycho clown, John Moxley, bandito, and a whole bunch of others all to Nashville during Starcast on Friday night. But before that, Nick Wayne is going to have one of the biggest tests he's ever had. He's going to be taking on the exact same performer. You just saw an AEW dynamite challenge hangman, Adam page for the AEW world title. The, the success of Nick Wayne has just blown everyone away. That's all happening the same day as the roast of Ric Flair on Friday, July 29th on the 30th, Bret Hart's on stage. So is Brian Danielson. So are the four horsemen on and on and on. All of this is included. Uh, all of our panels, there's like over 10 of them. They're all included with one bracelet purchase. You get to go to all those panels and you get to go see all your favorite wrestlers do some really cool meet and greets. Yes, we have a meet and greet with the horseman. Yes, we have it against the TBS set. You can't do that anywhere else. Yes, you can get your picture made with Rick in his retirement robe against that same set. Yes, you could stand next to David Crockett and Tony Schiavone on that same set and get your picture made. And yes, even if you missed your chance before, you can see Rick Flair wrestle his very last match. Tickets go back on sale because we're no longer at the Nashville Flair grounds. We're now at the municipal auditorium where he won, not one, but two world titles, both times the big gold belt. And it happens in Nashville the day after SummerSlam at six Oh five Eastern. And it's all happening at municipal auditorium. Pick your tickets up, Jeff. This is the, the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest non WWE, non AEW event of the year. And uh, I hope you'll check oh, it out. Far. At That's no disrespect. Well, in America. Oh, come on. I mean, I think outside of WWE and AEW, this is it. And, uh, when you see what we have planned 
or not the undercard, but the full match card, because this show is not just, you see Ric Flair wrestle, and then you'd get in your car and you leave. You're going to see a whole action packed pay-per-view hours upon hours. Maybe not one of those marathon pay-per-views, but you get the idea. You're going to get your money's worth. And, um, when people start seeing the different companies that are sending representatives that are represented and some of these matches multiple for the first time ever level dream matches with titles on the line with real implications. And it's all happening at municipal auditorium tickets on sale this Friday, Ric Flair's last match.com. I think it's going to sell out again, Jeff, Ric Flair's last match.com. I mean, you're so excited about being there. You're not even booked Dennis stamp style and you're going to be there. Did you, did you hold me back a few tickets for, for me? Are you going to let me sit like front row, second row, third row, maybe underneath hard camera? Um, I want to, as you know, this is a Jim Crockett promotion show. There are 15 sets of Crockett's coming to this because so many of their extended (laughs) fan, I'm not kidding. Mr. Crockett has a, has 16 hotel rooms held. Because there's so many extended family members in the Crockett that's, family who never attended a Crockett event. Now they're all getting to come to the very last one. That's uh, cool. I'm so excited to have a small part in all of this. And every now and again, I have a good idea, but these are the folks who've been putting together wrestling and doing it the way they've done it for so long. And I'm just tickled that our little convention gets to help be a part of it. But with that said, Jeff, I will put in a good word with Mr. Flair and Mr. Crockett. Please do. And we will get you and your father a private link where y'all can purchase tickets. Um, we're going to get you the promo code. The whole throwing thing. Little man, Mr. Chicken Salad. No, 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 no. You are, you're, look at that's I can. Well, look, I'll, I'll, let me just say this now. At least I invited you to a show in Nashville. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm at least inviting you. So. Oh boy, lots of fun today here on my world. We're going to be talking Slam Anniversary five next week. It's going to be fun, man. Can't wait to talk about Slam Anniversary, and I can't wait. Me and you get to hang out. And if I had to guess, uh, before the press conference or after the press conference, you and I are going to wind up in some meet and three, and you're going to order a whole damn chicken. It's going to be damn good. right. I'm starving right now. Conrad had a blast today. A lot of fun. I did too. And uh, before we get out of here. I can't let you go without hitting me and letting, letting you hit us with one Monty Brown impression. You going to do it. No, you're I've done mine. I got to hear I, yours. I, I, <laughs> say it. Like you mean it. I can't, I'm, I'm horrible on impressions from your diaphragm. Just say a pounce real loud. One more. I'm around. You're getting under my I, I spoke over you. I'll be quiet now. Okay. You're going to be, are you going to let me stand on stage? I'm going to let you say pounce. I, and I'm going to pounce you. We got to find Monty. Monty, <laughs> where are you? Jeff and I love you. And we worry, we worry about you and miss you every day. Hope you have a good one. We'll see you next week right here on my list.